So we have our friend joining us from uh, Monaco, in uh, almost in France, and who's yeah. going to bring in a different kind of um, dynamic. So Helena is someone who's spoken at international conferences. She was at the Combo Mela gathering of the world's greatest religious festival recently. Maybe she will tell us about that. And, and anyway, it's over to you to tell us your um, speech, Helena. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I really like what's been shared so far and I feel very inspired. So I started like very much asleep and I was, you know, believing what I was told and I was believing the programming and everything we learn in school. And then in 2011, I had uh, a spiritual awakening or I had this, in my life I was so not happy and I had everything in the physical world, but I was so unhappy. And I met two different people in two different airports that told me about Vipassana meditation. So I ended up going to uh, a center in Thailand where I did a 26 day meditation course in silence. And I didn't know what I was going to. I had no, no one around me had experience. I just knew I had to go and do it. And uh, I went and I followed the teachings and I had like a huge change in consciousness and it really changed my whole world. And it was this, from coming, being in that monastery and then coming back to the normal world, it was like a shock. And uh, for the last, uh, since 2011, I've been going forward and backwards 11 times to different monasteries and different traditions. Uh, and I've really been learning and raising consciousness and it changed my whole life. And I really, it put me towards the path of enlightenment and it changed the way I'm thinking. Before I would have uh, negative self-talk, talk, you had like always thinking going on. Um, and now it's all quiet. Uh, I notice if, if I start thinking, I know some, something is attaching to, to me and as something I can work with and it's very interesting. And uh, in my opinion, um, because I also feel like after I started meditating, I become more ethical, more moral, and I help people more, you know, it changed the way I, I do things in life. And I think, why don't we teach more people how to meditate? It doesn't cost much money and you can teach it. It's easily like they have, they have done a lot of research on this and they've proven that people who have achieved higher levels of consciousness affect the people around them. So why don't, you know, why don't we use this tool more? And in, I know it's known in India uh, for many, many years, but I mean, I was in Monaco, I lived in Norway and then I was in Monaco and no one ever told me about the path, how I can do this, how, how can I change myself, how can I help others more? And it's like, I really wish, um, yeah, we can start doing this right now. Um, and I think also it's important um, to know what your motivation behind doing something is, because I think very often we do what looks good in the society, but then the motivation for really doing it is maybe not as pure. And it took me a long time to understand, um, you know, if you really want to rise the vibration and become and truly enlightened and truly be like a change in the world, it always has to come from the heart and you have to develop that aspect of yourself. And it cannot be, you know, you have to work for others and not for yourself. You can work on yourself to raise yourself, but you always have to have the motivation that it is to help others or else it becomes like an ego game. And we've seen several other spiritual teachers and people in the world who does that. And it may be helped for a bit, but then it stops, you know? Um, so what I'm doing right now, I'm, uh, I'm doing a master in international affairs and diplomacy at the UNITAR with the United Nations and I also joined the Global Peace Chain that's a youth-led organization for 18 to 25 year olds uh, and they have uh, 
people from all over, I think it's 160 nations and around 3,000 uh, other uh, students. And I teach them, I'm going to have a, a summit now in Turkey, uh, in Istanbul. And it's, I think we're going to be 60 nations and 160 people because of the COVID, it's a bit, a bit less people. Uh, and I want to teach them meditation, ethics, morality, and really like, because they are youth leaders. So if you can like teach one youth leader in a society, they can teach people around them and then we can spread, you know, the good karma or the plant the seeds. So, yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting, it's so much I want to do with meditation. It's, um, I think it's such an underused tool. And I think it's sad because India has so, like the traditions there are so deep, but still there's, there are, there's not so much implemented in the society as it should be. But I guess, I think meditation is coming back in society and I think the world is changing. And I also find with COVID that more people has approached me after the lockdown and they want to learn and they're wondering what's going on with me and, and, and they see a change. So they want to find a way how they can change their life. And uh, yeah, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, thank you very much, Elena. I'm sure that um, we would all benefit from some meditation classes. Um, Helena teaches yoga and also meditation classes, partly online. Obviously, you can't do it in person now. And you've been studying with Tibetan Buddhists as well, haven't you? Um, yes. Yeah. Yes, and just tell us what it was like at the Kumbha Mela, just quickly. You've got a couple of minutes more. Oh, well, yeah. How uh, did you get there? Uh, it's well, I was invited uh, by the Indian Foreign Ministry and um, Modi, yeah, Mr. Modi. Uh, they invited one person from each country, so they sponsored a trip. And it was all kind of spiritual people from all over the world, from different traditions. So I got to learn a lot, uh, you know, from organizations I never heard about. And also to see all those uh, religious places in India was amazing. And also swim in the Ganges. Uh, that was quite an adventure. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so thank you so much. And I'm sure that, um, you know, we can all uh, a discuss at the end, but also exchange information and questions um, by email. So thank you for your contribution. So now we have a friend from India joining us from um, Jaipur. Uh, Professor Gulab Kothari is a very famous newspaper editor in Jaipur. He runs the Rajasthan Patrika, which has offices in many Indian um, towns, cities, and um, yeah. when I was last in Delhi, um, we met, and I was interviewed on his uh, television channel in their Delhi studio. So, um, and Gulab has just recently won a number of awards. He was just in a Zoom meeting with the Prime Minister of India, uh, President Modi. Um, so, has been devoting himself to both journalism but also the search for spirituality. And he's studying Sanskrit, reading the Vedas, and exploring the inner meaning of India's heritage. So, Gulab, are you there? Can you hear me? Thank you, Thomas. Greetings. Respected Chairman, Swami Nathan, sir, Thomas, all my soulmates, my namaskaram pranam to all of you. I'm so happy and I'm, I really welcome this idea of World Intellectual Forum with such a great initiative or rather well uh, required. I, everybody's so serious. I don't see people sitting together and talking about the world. Everybody is busy with oneself, all around one's right from morning to evening. But I appreciate this forum, all their efforts, and all my best wishes with this forum. And thank you, Thomas, for allowing me to join 
this participation. We have come across two words during this talk right now. One was civilization, the other was culture. I want to clarify this. The problem starts from here. The world issue starts from this place. Culture, we cannot create. Culture belongs to the geography of the land. Civilization changes with the time. So we have to understand or classify our dialogue. When we talk about spirituality, it is more close to the cultural values. Geography means this body itself. We are the products of the geography. What we eat, the product of this geography, the whole culture, all your traditions, all your music, you take any name in the life, and they all are directly governed by this geography. So the spirituality part is directly connected to this geography, which the, our modernization or globalization has really well damaged to Today we want to become one world, one culture, one habit, one tradition, one food. So we are changing this geographical difference the God has given us. Why we are so different? Let us go from that to my mind, this faith or what is the religion or the philosophy. These are all they have become more or less like a professions in this lifestyle today. And every profession has its own identity, its own value system, its own rigid attitudes, its own arrogance, its own superiority over the others. In India, we have hundreds, hundreds of religions. Nobody is ready to accept the other. You see, we, we say this, and whereas this variety in India itself is governed by the same geography. You see, and we do not, what, what I see today, the main reason of this clash, this terrorism, or non -violent, or the violence, is basically these fundamentals, fundamentalists, the religions. You see how they go, govern their own followers, how they teach them to hate the others. So basically when I say, let us first understand what is the purpose of my life? I don't know. Honestly speaking, this is the first thing we start from our home. Why I want to survive? Why I want to live? Is it because I have studied something? I got a job somewhere and then I will get retired from there and die away. Do I define the purpose of my life from this place? Because as far this Indian philosophy is concerned, it's really, really not only amazing, but giving you a very straight, definite lifestyle and a vision in accordance with the natural laws. We have two, two directions, two dimensions of life. One goes outside me outside in the world, one is inside me. Inside me is immortal, outside me is mortal. Why, why we cannot think in the same responsible? Now when we talk about peace, I need the peace, but who am I? I'm not the body, I'm not the mind, I'm not the intellect. 
I am the soul. I need the peace. My body doesn't need the peace. I use these tools. These are all my tools, body, mind, intellect, to create peace for me. Until, unless we make this participation or classification of our own life, it is not possible to go on the same route. What our education is doing? God has made us perfect person. We are born as perfect person. When we go to the college, they make us imperfect before we pass out, before we graduate from there. Two of our faculties are developed in education today, physical and intellectual. Nobody talks about the spiritual life at all. Not is there a single word in the whole education. No one talks how to govern the life through the desires. Then more and more you are educated, more and more you are grown on intellectual levels, physical levels, but more and more you are diminishing on the other two levels. So I live for me. What is the goal of the present day education? Good package. A good package means taking care of myself, my family. No more. But is it life? Can we look for a peace in this life when I don't belong to anybody? I don't care for anybody? We are not taught through, and I mean through all through these ages. No, India was not taught this. We were all taught to be the leaves of the same tree. Whether we live in America, South America or China or Japan or India, wherever we live, we are all the leaves of the same tree. Whether we are human beings, we are animals, we are plants, vegetables, none is disconnected from each other. So when you look for peace, you have to be little, light, large hearted. No, but this education today doesn't teach you to take care of the next person next door. This is the main problem. I want more and more. I'm not satisfied with what I have, what the God has given me in my family, in my society. I still want more. And for that, I can do any harm to anybody. I'm happy about it. We have many fundamentals like truth and nonviolence, you know, for the peaceful living. Who bothers about it? When we talk about nonviolence, it is not the killing which is weak, which is the real cause of nonviolence. Sorry, violence. Violence. Killing is the result, is the fruit. Seed is somewhere else. It is also like a tree. We, we also grow like a tree. Somebody after sowing the seed, how many years it takes to fruit. And same way with the violence or non-violence or the truth. They take years to develop or grow in your own personality right from the day you are born and we have to nurture from that day. The killing is the result, the fruit. Again I say, for example, if I want to tell a lie, I'm killing the truth. Is it not, not, is it not violence? This is the most, this is the, when you say truth, truth means something which was there yesterday, which is there today, and which will remain tomorrow. That is how we define truth. And when you lie, you are killing the truth. You are stealing the truth. You will be again lying again and again and again to hide away the first lie. See the, how we are going away. This education is taking you away from yourself. 
from your spiritual level, from your soul to elsewhere. Have you ever heard any seed eating its own fruits? No. We want to eat our own fruits. We don't want our children also to eat it. Is it possible? See the reasons of crisis. It lies there. Another thing is, I want all the facilities of the world for myself. What does it mean? If a seed doesn't want to die, it can go and stay in a warehouse and a cold storage. It will not die. But is it there any guarantee that it will grow into a tree? It can never. It has to die. It has to forget its own existence to turn into a tree. We all talk about this peace. How many conferences we have in the world every year on peace and non-violence and still there is no peace. Why only the violence is growing? We must think on the various different individual aspects where there is no human respect. First thing we should start from education. Everybody needs that part if we start enter or say include spirituality in the curriculum, compulsory, the world of heart, the love, basically the love, to give, giving is the answer of peace. If you learn giving, you have no problem in this life. But we want more, we want more, then you are a beggar, a born, a, an educated beggar, or you show some stick and ask for more, still you are a beggar. There can be no peace. You have to learn giving, you have to give, learn giving like a tree. Finally, the same seed turns into a tree, but nobody doesn't bother who is going to eat the fruits, who is going to enjoy the, she or the shade, how many, which type of birds will come and have the nest. It is a different world, but the same, all those birds also belong to you, you are part of it, you are connected with the same, all those birds or animals or the vegetation. In India we say, we, as per our deeds, karmas, we take different shapes and different bodies. So when this body has an expiry date, it will go. My soul doesn't die. So I will change the body. So I may become the bird, I may become the tree, whatever. This is how we need this unification of this whole globe, all the whole universe is one part, one single piece. No education teaches us this. We always have a clash. I live for my body. See, I am as an individual. I have my dreams, whereas there is no I in the whole universe. No. So anybody who is living for I, going to die without any contribution to the society, to the family, to himself or herself. No. It's a futile life. Honestly, if really we want to do this, then as a journalist, I can still say there is one more good course we can adopt, and that is communication. There is no, there is no life without communication. Everybody knows it. But communication has its own merits and demerits. You see, when you communicate with your body, it goes through the body. From the brain, it goes to the brain. From the heart, it goes to the heart. And from the soul, it goes to the soul. 
whatever where you want to reach where you want the transformation to be done in the human society you need to communicate from your level the problem is that we are not involved we just want things to be done we or it should be done this way or that way but we don't get involved you were talking about the meditation how does it mean it's purely communication spiritual communication to yourself about yourself every the mother talks to the child when it is in the womb pure communication see this is also again a form of meditation a soul to soul communication is the answer for any transformation otherwise no transformation is possible it will go strike there and come back to me it it should be useful to the society this is what i still want to say and you all my my experience i can, i can guarantee that results will come only because of this you start when you start writing when you do anything you do you involve yourself first you are there with the work if when you write you are right you can see your face in the words you are traveling to the reader we own those words then there is no issue at all the reader will see your face in those words and will follow what you have said the first thing we must guarantee our own involvement you can't ask from somebody you do this for me and do this for me and this for me no who will do for you first you learn to do for others that we don't do our education pattern is the main devil i call it for the whole human society it has destructed all human values you have taken away everybody from the soul nobody knows that who am i who is the person living in this body nobody knows and there is no time for anybody to think about your own spirit the soul then where is the spirituality where we are connected with the nature how i can to go and get can get back to my own god i cannot meet him again because education is taking me away but well it is the answer it will go away with this body nothing will remain so i think before i want to just conclude that we learn to involve first our own souls we just who are first we know who are we do we understand our own soul who is living which is living in this body we are not body let us please ensure it think 10 times talk to yourself about yourself at least 10 minutes a day and you will know what is reality in your own life and how can you be purposeful to the rest of the world thank you right uh, thank you very much uh, dr kathari for your wise words you've reminded us that we're souls and we can use our intellects as tools but we shouldn't identify with our intellect so we're the world soul forum who are pretending to be intellectuals thank you <laughs> and you've also told us ab about the importance of education which i couldn't agree with more yes i uh, mean we need a subgroup for the world intellectual forum on education i think and bringing spirituality into the classroom meditation practice you know it should be done in every school around the world i agree 100% yeah so look we have um people want to ask questions but we're going to wait till the end because we still have a couple of speakers and we have a friend joining us from canada um who's uh satyan raja i'd like to introduce to you um satyan is originally from well he can explain he's from africa via london to canada and has been working very important uh, project to create a world wisdom council or a council of wisdom um keepers so i'm hoping sachin can explain this project to us 
introduce yeah. yourself and tell us how is what's the state of the world's wisdom Sachin, in your reading and how can we get peace please very good thank you well, namaste dearest elders family wherever you are in the world it's a wonderful honor to be amongst you all i'm looking forward to hear and listen and receive your wisdoms so my name is satyan raja i'm of gujarati indian descent born in uganda and i am raised mostly in canada and i'm raised in very i uh, was brought up in steeped in martial art traditions wisdom traditions of india of the east of asia and such and I've been running schools, training organizations now for about 30 years from martial arts to human potential, meditation schools. And our organization, Warrior Sage, has been training tens of thousands of people per year all around the world in cutting edge consciousness methods of self illumination, self determination, um, self realization. My experience has been that. So many of us, we all have such great philosophical depth, understanding, and wisdom, but sometimes everyday people, they are suffering with problems. We can come from a very high state of consciousness, aiming to try to share wisdoms of love, unity, oneness, and peace. But if people have many antagonistic challenges within themselves, it's hard for them to receive higher sadhana, higher dharma, when they're dealing with everyday problems with their neighbors, with their wives, with their husbands, with their children and such. Everyone knows what I'm talking about. It's, higher, it's harder to get deeper wisdom immersed into a state of consciousness which is not ready for that soil. So my mission, my aim is how can we get the soil of consciousness? As Elder um, uh, Patrika has just shared about, we need to have this wisdom come into a form of living embodiment through education and understanding. So in my understanding, if I take a look at what is the root of all our lack of peace, the war, the fighting, I believe that the external wars that we have in the world, no matter what size they are, are a reflection of the internal wars we have within ourselves. What are these internal wars? Where these internal wars are antagonistic dualities. So I'll come right to the point. Antagonistic dualities. We see this happening in politics right now in America. We see the left antagonistic with the right, the right antagonistic with the left. Both are demonizing each other. Both are tearing each other down. One person starts to say something, the other side cuts them down to the core, ridicules them, demonizes them, makes them inhuman. The other side says something, this side says the same thing. The faces change. We can argue about the faces. We can say this face is right, this is wrong, this is right, this is wrong. But every four, five, six, eight years, depending on what system, the faces change, but the same dynamics are there. Antagonistic duality. For one, let's say one party, as an example, one organization. If I want to be at the top of my party, I have to tear down. I have to ridicule, shame. I have to try to break down people in my own party, cut them down, cut them down, cut them down until I win. Then when I'm at the top, I have to make friends in an illusory way with all the people I have just dismissed, demonized for the... <laughs> now, now we have to show up as a unified team to fight this side. This side, they have gone from demonizing, cutting up each other to come to the top of their picking order. Now they've come to the top. Now they have to all become friends to fight this demon, demonic side. This has been the game. The faces change, the colors change, the surface politics, the promises change. But at the core of it, the very architecture of the systems that we feel are aiming to come into higher resolution and service for humanity, their very architecture is based on antagonistic duality. Us versus them. Us versus them. For and against. For and against. The perpetuation of antagonistic duality, to me, is the foundational core of our suffering, and it's continuously pouring gas on the state of being. So how do we deal with this? 
Well, I have found that philosophical injection, aiming to use good words, empathy, sympathy, is valuable. It raises the consciousness. It does soften the blow. It does make people more open to receive a higher form of unity consciousness that integrates the prior antagonistic dualities. So for me, wisdom, what is wisdom? Wisdom is all of us, we've had the wisdom. We're of the age enough that if we see children crying over ice cream, we're not gonna cry about it. We're gonna say, it's okay, children, whether they were our own children, nephews, nieces, grandchildren. We can come from an elevated state seeing how ridiculous it is to cry over ice cream or a little chocolate or a little toy. But from our state of consciousness, we understand that they're having an antagonism. But when you're in the thick of it, when you are the one, the child with the toy that's having the fight, it feels so real. It feels that we must fight and cry over this. So who can we be as leaders, guides, mentors, transmissions of truth and unity? I believe that we need to find where our antagonistic dualities are, the ones that trigger us the most, and then bring them into unity. And when we bring them into unity, our own consciousness shifts. We can say less, but we offer a transmission that brings together people who are in an antagonistic space. Because we are grounded in the who am I, we are grounded in the divine essence of our unity. We are grounded in our Atma, in our own Samadhi. So I believe that the attainment of Samadhi, or the direct experience of truth, is our really our only way <laughs> to having a shift in consciousness, not just mentally, but an embodied shift in consciousness, which can accept, embrace the dualities of life, and rather than make them antagonistic, we can make them complementary. How can we do this? Well, I have been, my whole life has been researching what are consciousness methods that transcend any type of religious orientation that are drawn from them, that everyday people can do, everyday people can be guided through, from leaders to everyday people, everyday people, all the way to the leaders of the world. How can we find a way? So today in the next five minutes, seven minutes, I would like, us, I would like to invite us all to go through a meditation practice, very simple, that integrates these antagonistic dualities. So may I ask everyone's permission if we're willing to go through a little fun exercise? Sure, go for it. Okay. It'll be very short. This way we can have an experience. So let us pick two things that we have opposites with. Left versus right. Communism versus capitalism. Find some type of polarity, some type of opposition that has some type of internal trigger or charge that has some type of tension. Um, poor versus rich is another very powerful one. Spirituality versus making a successful livelihood. These also can be conflicting. Another one should be, should we be self-determined versus should be for the all? Should we be in service, in seva for the all? These are very real philosophical debates that are going on in our own consciousness, which are being inflamed by other people around us. Those with the capitalistic bend will say, we cannot take care of everyone. If we do, we will bankrupt ourselves. How can we do this? Those with more of a left leaning will say, we cannot just take care of ourselves. This is greedy. This is inhuman. We are not taking care of our world family. And they have a point. So please find your counterpoints, one and the other. I'm going to take us through a very quick exercise, okay? So does everyone have a duality that they can think of? Some type of opposite? Okay. So I want us to close our eyes and I want us to feel the first duality, the one which has charge, one side. Let's say I'm going to use the term left and right as an example, okay? Think of the term left, socialism, communism, Feel that fully, what that represents, what that means. And then say something about it into the space, whatever comes up. 
Very good. Let's release that side. And now let's feel the other side. Let's talk about capitalism. Or you can choose your own duality. But I'm using this as an example. Self-determination, capitalism, making it on your own. Feel that fully. And then just say something about it into the realm. Once again, let's go to the opposite side. Let's feel the left-leaning side or whatever of your choice is and go deep into that. Feel it fully. Magnify it, dramatize it. And then say something about it. Now we'll go to the other side. We're going to go back and forth like a teeter-totter. Go deep into the other side. The other side being... Self-determination, capitalism, profit. We're going to do this once again. Feel one, the other side again. One for all, sharing, community, liberalism, socialism. And then say something about it. And now let's go to the other side once again. Capitalism, self-determination, profits first. Now we're going to do something interesting. Feel both sides at the same time, please, and take a slow, deep breath in and out. And then share what's happening between the two. If you do it fully, they will start to merge. We will do this whole pattern again a little faster. I'm going to go left, right, left, right, okay? Feel the left side. Socialism, communism, anything like this, or whatever your chosen opposite is. Magnify it, dramatize. Now let's feel the other side once again. Capitalism, personal gain personal profit, serving the I self. Feel that fully and say something about it. Let's release that side and go back to the left. One for all, all for one, sharing, distribution, co-ownership, society lifted all together. Feel that fully and let that go. And now the other side, please, which is self-determination, personal attainment, being responsible for your own success. Feel that fully. Say something about that. Okay, let's go one more time to the other side. Go more to the left leaning. Go deep into that feeling. The energy, the images, the thoughts. Take a breath, release that side. Please go to the other side once again, which is going deep into the self-determination, right wing. The state is strong. Okay, very good. Now feel both at the same time, please. Left and right, or whatever your chosen antagonistic dualities are, and take a slow, deep breath in and out. How many, please raise your hand if you're feeling they're starting to merge or become one in some way. What is the difference? If you do the exercise fully, there is no difference. The dualities dissolve and one comes into a harmonious union, accepting and embracing the spectrum of the wisdom of the whole. We'll do this one more time very rapidly. Okay? Feel the left side. This will take one minute. Feel the left side. Go deep into it. Feel the right side. Go deep into it. 
Feel the left side magnify, dramatize. Feel the right side magnetize, dramatize. Please feel the left side deeply, fully. And the last time, feel the right side fully. And now feel both at the same time. And please take a slow, deep breath in and out. And surrender and allow them to merge into a higher order of consciousness. And now expand this state of union infinitely in all directions. When you're ready, you can open your eyes. Any shares about your experience, Thomas or Helena or anyone, any, any share about this state of oneness? You feel it, right, Thomas? Yes, that was, <clears throat> that was a brilliant little um, example of your work in action. So thank you. We're going to do discussion at the end. So yes, so I, will, I will complete now by sharing that I have done this process with hundreds thousands online, thousands in a room, in, sta in stadiums. And we have seen people from Palestine and Israel at wars coming to, before they came, after doing this exercise, coming into love and union and seeing each other as world family. So this to me is a gift in the world that we can find a way to heal the rift by seeing the union between our antagonistic dualities. And in closure, I would like to say that I will, Thomas has graciously, has graciously said, please invite everyone here. We hold a gathering of wisdom keepers every three weeks. I'm happy to share and they're wisdom holders from all around the world, from every continent. And we are sharing ways to offer the young people, the spiritual activists, the warriors of the world, ways that in the old days, Warriors would come to the wise people, the elders, to learn, to get direction on how to move the world forward. So I would love to invite all of you to join our Wisdom Keepers gathering, and I will share that context with Thomas, and we will send you that invitation. Those of you who can join, it would be our greatest honor. All my love and gratitude. Right. Uh, blessings. Thank you so much, Satyan. His name means truth. He's a truth warrior. And uh, it's an honor to have you with us. Um, right, so thank you very much. Now we need to move on. Um, <clears throat> we have, uh, do we have Dr. Ian Fry with us? And are you ready to um, share your presentation, sir? Ian is well, in Australia. Did you happen to receive my email in time? It's yes, I did. Ian. And I think um, Nicola has it. And when you're ready to go, if you say, you know, she'll share it. Yeah. Okay. I'll so do introduce it. yourself. Ian is on the board of the World Intellectual Forum. He's been active in Australian um, uh, politics of peace in the Middle East. He has a doctorate from the University of Melbourne and um, has been at this for a very long time, still hoping for a peace breakthrough in the Middle East. We're doing what we can to uh, bring that about. And with Marco and myself, he's helping the interfaith wing of the World Intellectual Forum um, develop. So welcome Ian, go for it. Thank you Thomas. Uh, I, I re regret that I pounced it on you at the last minute, but I appreciate that you can now use it for me. And I'm uh, uh, discarding the basis or the, the bulk of my prepared paper, which will be available for distribution to concentrate on those uh, uh, slides which I will ask for in due course. Uh, introducing myself as you say, I'm uh, a scholar of the University of Divinity in Melbourne. I chair the Interfaith Commission of the Victorian Council of Churches uh, and I'm heavily involved in interfaith affairs in a number of respects. Um, now, um, the Prerequisite to peace, as far as I'm concerned, uh, must include two vital considerations. 
the understanding and the acceptance of the legitimacy of all world faiths and the acceptance that responsibility comes before privilege under religious understanding and any sense of superiority must be suppressed um, in particular by the three Abrahamic faith communities which have um, long been in conflict over questions of theological um, superiority and uh, uh, cultural influence. Uh, we can only begin effective dialogue at a peacemaking level when these things are understood. And um, we've got to work then towards, through that, towards the full integration of all faith, uh, faith and philosophies into the life of the communities in which they exist and worship and play an important part. Um, that raises uh, all sorts of questions. Um, it requires, uh, in due course, the disbanding of political parties based on faith, which was a major concern during World War II, but continues to be a concern in a number of countries. Um, once we have a proper understanding of the interrelationship of world faith, then political parties have, uh, have no place to be bound with religion or the other way around. Um, and uh, one of the charts, perhaps I should ask that one to come up first. Um, if uh, your colleague could bring up the third chart, please, Thomas. Bypass that one. Number three you want, okay. Yes, that one, thank you. Um, th th this should become the, the basis of a new educational paradigm. We cannot understand the relationship between the world faiths without a clear understanding of their origins and the things which, they, which have influenced their existence and interaction. And I'm not suggesting that you try to study that chart on the screen, but it will simply indicate for you the, uh, the nature of understanding which we've got to develop that there are several streams of religious understanding and several stages in their development and um, they are all shown. Uh, I divide them into three streams and three um, uh, phases um, where, and the expansion of each of them has brought us to the present very complex world interfaith situation. Um, people don't like having to recognize that their faith might not be paramount um, uh, because of their historical precedence. Um, but with the aid of this chart and a new approach to religious education, it can all unfold. Thank you. Um, now, if we go back a step to chart uh, the first one, please, uh, Thomas. The religious uh, problems which we have are linked in to the development of two global group uh, um, blocks at the moment. One I call the White Western Christian block, which is there illustrated in blue, and the other is the world majority people. And uh, it shows the imbalance of world influence commercially and uh, in a religious sense with the, with the WWCB being only 24% of the world's population with the world majority peoples accounting for 76%. Now, if we go to the next chart, you will see that that's changing very significantly and dynamically and that within the next two to three generations, the, the Western Christian bloc will have shrunk to about 17%. Uh, 
the world majority people will then account for 83 and you cannot sustain current power relationships with that happening and we should recognize it now and work to undo that relationship and that requires complete restructuring of the united nations which a number of people have referred to and we could spend a long time in that but such a restructuring um, must involve um, uh, the elimination of the Security Council's veto rights by, by a few powers, um, the restructuring of the World Trade Organization and uh, UNESCO and each of the other major uh, instrument to the United Nations and if I can jump down to the fifth chart now the bottom one thank you um, this illustrates the uh, impact of the division between the two blocks can you just shift it a touch so that the whole of the, the chart is on the screen thanks um, that indicates, and I've used World Bank data to prepare this chart, it shows the relationship between the 24% of the world which sits in the WWC CB group um, and its economic influence um, uh, um, by the uh, the rate at which it has uh, grown in the last 57 years compared with the rest of the world's population. The blue poles show the uh, number of multiplications of the GDP of the Western world uh, during that period. And you see how it relates to the other uh, block the, the group of 18 in the, the world majority people's group is only one quarter of the rate of multiplication of the western world group but the big contrast comes with the select four which are members of the world majority people's group namely singapore japan china and uh, Botswana, which together have a multiplication effect of 111 times in 57 years because of their preferential positions strategically and in favoured relationships. And um, if you, oh, I haven't coloured the, the blue in the, the right hand side, I'm sorry. You can see that the net result is that if you ignore, <laughs> look at the extreme right hand column um, overall the uh, the western world group has been multiplying its gross domestic product at uh, three to four times the rate of the rest of the world that is totally intolerable and it's the consequence of the political colonial and economic policies that we have all experienced and know very well um, so may I go back now to chart, um, the one above it, chart four. Um, and I'm conscious of, my, I'm going to run out of time, so I must pass this one very quickly too. Um, but this one, if you could balance that in the middle of the screen too. And again, you will all receive this with the printed paper in due course. Um, you see the dynamic growth of the last um, three generations that dark, black line is the actual population graph of, uh, of the world and um, the projections for population for uh, uh, 2200 was that we would reach 11 billion but that has been dramatically reduced now to, you see there, um, only um, uh, 9.7 billion to be reached within the next 
generation or two. And that involves all sorts of population changes, relationships, and economic relationships as well. And the Western world is hell-bent on preventing the change in relationships, the shift in power from itself, the Western world, to the non-Western world. Um, and there are big dangers in that. Um, the, the harder they try to, to prevent the, the shift in power, the uh, more certain the change is and the more traumatic it must be. And the rest of the world is coalescing around the leadership of China. You might say, what's China got to do with the white Western, Western world or otherwise? Um, the, it's, the leadership is, is coalescing around um, the hegemonic policies of the United States, principally at the moment, the crisis in the Middle East, you know, centered on the religious, religion-based conflict between, in Jerusalem and the division between the three Abrahamic faiths, the rejection of global warming and climate change, and the, if the economic imbalance of, of, between the colonizing powers and the rest, which uh, is illustrated in that final chart, which you just had a brief look at. Now, um, any state that wishes to be a member of the United Nations in whatever form it takes in future, and I'm one of those who is eager to see the change come, and it, I know various proposals for form uh, have been made. I, I don't want to get involved in arguments about that. The important thing that the change must take place and take place pretty quickly. Um, and any member of the United Nations should be obliged to acknowledge and, acknowledge and accept the authority of each of the instruments of the United Nations, notably the International Court of Justice and the International Criminal Court. And if it defaults on agreed contributions to operating units, notably the World Health Organization and UNESCO, it should lose voting privileges until it makes good its contributions to the United Nations funds. The, the application of economic boycotts, which has had a big influence on the previous chart that you've looked at, um, and the misuse of technological privilege through um, uh, patent rights and uh, 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 bounty arrangements um, uh, must be uh, got rid of. Um, and this re requires a complete change in the nature of the World Trade Organization. Um, and uh, the application of boycotts, and especially secondary boycotts, should be absolutely prohibited under the United Nations regulations. Now, you know, obviously you know which countries I'm pointing at in particular, but there are countries such as Australia, which are tagging along on the bootstraps of the United States and have got to share responsibility for this dramatic imbalance. And they've got to help take the lead with the non-Western world of Asia and Africa um, joined by um, the countries of Latin America, which are rapidly shifting from their former allegiance with the Western world to their allegiance with the non-Western world. And um, uh, this makes it far more difficult for the dominant powers of the West to maintain their present policies. But while they have people like Australia sending battleships to share the Straits of South, of South China Seas with the US and uh, ha uh, house their troops and provide um, uh, signals, facilities and so forth for the United States, then it makes it very difficult for the Australian people to break their current allegiance uh, and take proper action that they should together with the 
uh, the, the west of the the rest of the non-western world now um how am i going for time well no thank you so much ian i think we're pretty much out of time now we have to move on but there is going to be questions at the end okay. so um we could all you know have a bit extra time but now since you're so concerned that we move on to the um the South Block, I think we need to have a speaker from the Islamic faith. We haven't had our Muslim today. And um, it's very important. I welcome Professor Aslam Khan. I hope he's with us um, from the Mahatma Gandhi University in India. Uh, can you hear me, sir? Uh, you'll have to unmute. <clears throat> Uh, Professor Khan organized a big conference online uh, recently um, from the Mahatma Gandhi University on, on World Peace Day, 21st of um, September, and uh, had particularly asked to join us on this occasion. Um, seems to be <clears throat> perhaps have, having some difficulty connecting. Right. Um, can I just ask, whilst we're waiting for him to connect, uh, we have our colleague uh, from Armenia, Gavork. You haven't said anything so far. And you're, um, we heard a brilliant exercise about how to make peace between uh, oppositional dualities. But your country, Armenia, is currently involved in a conflict. There's fighting going on at the present time with Azerbaijan, who are mostly Muslims, whereas you're mostly Christian. Tell me, A, what's happening at the moment in Armenia and Azerbaijan. Share it with the group and tell us, um, have you learned anything so far in our discussions that can help you solve that conflict? <laughs> You'll have to unmute um, before you... Yeah, can you unmute yourself? Uh, we can't hear you, Gavork. Sorry, sorry. Uh, I'm Gavork Manukian from uh, Armenia. I'm a lawyer and human rights defender uh, and uh, represent uh, the World uh, Intellectual Forum in uh, Armenia as well. Uh, I would like to express uh, my thankfulness, uh, Dr. Duffer, for initiating of this very interesting uh, forum. And also, uh, I thank you, uh, thank uh, all uh, speakers for their very interesting and I would say very useful uh, presentations. Yes, uh, currently my country is facing a very difficult time. Uh, on uh, mo uh, Sunday morning, uh, September 27, uh, Azerbaijan started a large-scale war uh, against uh, Nagorno-Karabakh and uh, Armenia as well, because uh, uh, during the last two days, uh, uh, they uh, started uh, uh, bombing also territory of uh, Republic of Armenia. We have uh, already uh, also victims uh, among civilians and uh, uh, about uh, 85 uh, 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 victims. So it's very pity, it's very difficult time and I would uh, appreciate if colleagues will pray for, for peace in our region. Thank you. Right, thank you. <laughs> 
Okay, so whilst we track down our um, final speaker, Professor Aslam Khan, I hope he'll join us. Um, I think we can open the floor to questions then a little early. And um, I know that um, we had a question um, from our friend in um, <clears throat> Trans Brahma, uh, perhaps, uh, Dr. Siddhartha. You had a question, I believe, for Gulab Kathari. Do you want to um, proceed? Sorry, can you can you hear me, um, Dr. Siddhartha? What was your question to um, Gulab Kathari? Gulab is back with us. Um, sir, K. Siddharth, sir, you may ask question to Gulab Kuthari, sir. Uh, yes, yes, that's right. Yes, yes, sir. Uh, we have been ardent admirer of you, uh, sir, all in all. Uh, while you were delivering your speech, uh, I, I noticed two aspects. Uh, you're talking about uh, uh, religion and that uh, religion has been uh, people going to be pursuing different type of religions in the country. Now, is it not that if you can go to see it purely from an Indian perspective, purely from an Indian perspective, there is a good amount of a difference between religion and dharma. Dharma is a, what we go to be calling is your duty, your duty bound to respond to certain things in a certain manner that is very, very humane. And a religion is a, a, it's a dogma that has been defined by some maybe church, maybe by temple, maybe by masjid, and so on, that you have to follow. What do you think is going to be the basic ethos that should go to define India in order, to, in order for its diversity to coexist in this place? You'll have to unmute um, Dr. Katari. <clears throat> Sorry. Dharma is an individual definition. It is not the social one. It belongs to every individual individually. My dharma cannot be my brother's dharma or my father's dharma or anybody's dharma. It is, you can say in practice, it is my relation with my God, if I believe or I don't believe, whatever but it is my individual relationship with the, those aspects of life. That's all is dharma. That only guides me to my karma. You see, that becomes my identity in the society, but it has nothing to do with the religion. Religion is a set of principles guided by somebody. There is one head on that particular sect. We call it sect. And all the sects are have guided by or organized by a single guru. You know, this is a basic difference. That my natural, whereas sect is man-made, the rules are man-made. So definitely there is a lot of opposition in the thought process, lot of diversity and lot of clashes. Most of the clashes in the name of religion, you will see because of these diversifications. Uh, sir, precisely my question. I mean, this is what I have been asking. That is, uh, once you go on to consider that, uh, that the, I mean, everyone's dharma is to protect their country, to protect uh, the fellow human beings, uh, to do their basic duty as a human being, uh, then there is no conflict at all. So people do tend to follow religion, but they don't go on to follow their dharma. And what if dharma is towards uh, the basic care, uh, a response towards humanity, trying to be human, that is what they don't want to follow. Is it not that is the bane of the problem that the country faces? The, I told you in the beginning, the basic solution is the education. You know, I don't know how far you have gone through the ancient literature, but our literature, at least you know Mahabharata. There was somebody like Abhimanyu, who learned all the tactics in the womb? This is 
the real good proof to say that all mothers can handle the lives of their children, can inculcate all the samskaras before they are handed over to the society. Agreed. So then it's like a part. No society can change it after it is delivered. So what you need here is to define the course where the humans are framed in the human environment, human society in a social manner. You have to define the human, not the body. The, the true problem today is we are talking more about the body, about the costumes, about the manners or whatever, telak or mala, whatever. No. This is all going to destroy. It's all destructible, perishable. When you want to talk for the peace, for the humanness, you have to talk through the spiritual language, through the language of oneness. And I can, if I harm you, I am harming myself. If I can understand this, I will never harm anybody. That's all is the principle. And this is what should be taught in the education right from in all the schools. This is what we are we are taken away. We are teaching only the courses to give sir, you the job. Sir, may I intervene, sir? Precisely, this is a, going to be another question, not exactly another, it's an appendage of that question. That is a, the basic difference between a spiritualism and religion eh, is not exactly understood in uh, the country. And uh, most of the people go on to tend, they tend to follow religion eh, rather than being a spiritual. Now, is it not that this is what exactly education goes on to require? That is, uh, they should be taught right from the beginning about the difference between spiritualism and that of religion. So the problem is going to be solved in this case. Eh? Is it not so? No, this is, first thing is you have to teach the person, you know, there is the very clear the definition of education is very clearly defined in the ancient literature. That you are creating a perfect person. You see, and to understand himself or herself first, our this education doesn't go that far. It doesn't tell you that you understand yourself first. They just tell you how to live, how to earn your living bread and butter, get in a job, retire and get lost. Do you think this is why a human being is born? And it is known as the best creature out of 8.4 8, 8. million? I think we have to review this again. How to define this human and how to make this human being again a complete human being before he or she leaves the school or colleges. Then you see, they will form the best society. But That's today, good. see what we are doing: <clears throat> this television, internet, mobile phone. They are all making them individualistic. You know, they are not concerned with the people in the house, members of the family. Everybody will have their own mobile phone, and then how will you expect them to consider the neighborhood or the people or the talk about the state or the nation? They don't belong to the land. The education is taking them away. Are you teaching them in the local geography? Nobody knows where I am born. What is grown there? Nothing about the land. So if I learn, I study in Jaipur or in New York, there is no difference. I don't right. know which um, one is Can I just interject there? Um, we, we've got some other things we need to attend to. Our speaker, who was supposed to here represent Islam, was going to add a very important voice to our meeting. I don't want to get too, you know, into any one particular discussion here. But um, for some reason, he's vanished. So we have an existential crisis on our hands because the Muslims represent a billion people on the planet. And um, I'm, I'm going to do something um, somewhat um, adventurous. I'm going to give the talk he would have done and I'm going to put my Sufi hat on. Not all of you know that I'm an initiated Sufi, as well as a Christian and a Druid and all the rest of it. And I've, I've taught Islamic studies at a very high level 
in uh, the Muslim Centre in London with Dr. Zaki Badawi. And I'm just completing a commentary on the entire Quran. So I want to give this final closing talk instead of our professor from Mahatma Gandhi University. I'm going to give it with my Muslim hat on. If he turns up, I will give him the floor, no problem. But I think it's important you hear this voice. Okay. So um, in the question of what is religion, what is spirituality, what is philosophy, it's very important that we listen as a planet to the Muslim voice. This is why I've spent eight years doing a commentary on the Quran, because as far as I can see it, the mass media demonizes Muslims. They are the terrorists, they're out to get us, they're going to blow us up and all this stuff. And I've, I, as a peace scholar, I've questioned this. When I taught at the Muslim College in London, I met the most polite, the most intelligent, the most kind and highly educated people I've ever had the pleasure to teach. You know, and so it made me really rethink what is this demonization of Muslims. And I went very deeply into the comparative study of Islamic and Western Christian and Jewish cultures. Um, and I want to share therefore the fruits of about 20 years of in-depth scholarship here into what is Islam. The first point I want to make is that the Quran is a series of revealed texts or channelings by a man who was essentially un unliterate. He was unlearned. He wasn't somebody who could read or write. He'd never read the Bible and he couldn't read the Vedas, etc. But he was a man of great principle, a great intelligence. Um, and he had picked up in the oral traditions of the desert area of Arabia, Mecca and Medina and environment. He'd picked up on certain what we would call Gnostic teachings, uh, which were in the Gnostic Christian church. He was a kind of Gnostic Christian. And most Christians don't realize this. Actually, Muhammad was a Gnostic Christian. They don't even know what a Gnostic is, let alone a Gnostic Christian. A Gnostic Christian is somebody that believes in the elevation of the human being back to the spiritual identity, which is what all our speakers have talked about, that we are actually souls in incarnation and bodies, right? And, and the Gnostic tradition knows that. They believe that Jesus came to teach that. He wasn't come to create a religion. He was here to bring a liberational discourse of enlightenment, which is the reminder of who we are. We're all children of God. Yeah. He never said, there's one wonderful verse in the Quran where um, it imagines Jesus going back to heaven after his death with all the other apostles, all the spiritual teachers of humanity. That includes every single Rishi or Buddhist or realized saint. God says to them all, well, what did you teach? Did mankind listen? And they say, well, we don't know. We just gave the messages and we did what we could. And then God says to Jesus, he said, here, Jesus, did you really go down there and tell them to worship you and your mother and not me, God? And Jesus said, no, of course I didn't. That's just ridiculous. <laughs> so you see, in the mind of Muhammad, this, this Jesus worship or Christolatry is actually a heresy. From the universal perspective of the Gnostic Christian perspective, we shouldn't worship Jesus. We should worship God. And Jesus is a messenger of God. He's someone bringing us a teaching, right? So that's where the Quran is coming from. Now, there are other passages in the Quran that prove that Muhammad had listened orally to some of the New Testament stories, including some of the Gnostic stories. Now, if you've not read your Gnostic Gospels recently, um, you know, that's very naughty. You should do that because they're really interesting. The Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Mary Magdalene and so on. And these were suppressed by the church. And, you know, there is a thing in religion where the officialdom calls the other people heretics and persecutes them. And I think as philosophers, we should always be, um, you know, asking, well, hang on, give the heretics a little voice here because often they're the suppressed people with the truth. So anyway, in the Gnostic scriptures, there's a very obscure passage. It's called the Infancy Gospel of Jesus, apparently by Thomas. And Thomas reports a very strange story. When Christ was a boy, he used to play games with his friends. Because he was psychic, clairvoyant, he had what 
Buddhists were called siddhis, he had these spiritual powers. He was always tricking them, like appearing, jumping off a roof and appearing in funny places, you know, playing games like Superman. And one of the games he used to play was he would take some clay birds made out of clay, he'd fashion them from mud, and he'd blow on them and they'd turn into real birds and fly away. This was a game that Jesus used to like to play when he was about 12 or 13. Now, what does that mean? You know, I think it means we can interpret that allegorically. What Jesus had the power to do as a Gnostic teacher was to take somebody's soul and body, a person, wounded, ill, sick, crazy, like a clay bird, blow on them, and they become fully human and enlightened and like normal because they remember their divine wings, they can fly again. Okay, now what's really interesting is that exact same story that is in the Gnostic scriptures, written about, well, uh, not long after Jesus, you know, in his lifetime, Thomas lived in his lifetime, he was his disciple, that very same teaching turns up in the Quran. Muhammad tells the same story about clay birds. Well, how does it get there? Well, it proves my point that Muhammad was a disciple of the Gnostic Christian underground, which was circulating orally in the deserts of Arabia. We also can tell this by the fact that near there, there was a, a city called Hira, which was the capital of the Lakhmid kingdom, which was a kingdom of Arabians in Southern Iraq before Basra or any of these cities were built. It was the capital of Lakhmid Arabian. It was a powerful kingdom between Arabia and the Persian Empire. The Lakhmid capital of Hira was very interesting because it had Manichaean Christians, it had Jewish people living there, it had pagan Arabs, and it had Zoroastrians, and it had Nestorian Christians. We know about this city. And it was on the trading routes from Mecca. And the very strong probability, which I explore in my commentary on the Quran, because I'm trying to explore where did this scripture come from? What, it, what is it? It's almost certain Muhammad used to go to Hira on his, on his business, on his trading routes. It's, it's straight line from Mecca. If you were taking goods to Persia, you stopped at Hira. He would have offloaded the goods and they would have been taken on the next day to Persia. Now, you can see Muhammad in the, in the cafes having his overnight stay in the, in the inn and chatting to all these amazing people, Jewish savants, Zoroastrians, Manichaeans, Nestorians. That's the thought world that the Quran comes from, right? Now, to clinch this, Muslim scholars hundreds, thousands of years ago already said that the Arabic alphabet, which the Quran is written in, was invented in Hira. Let that just sink in a minute. The Arabic alphabet that the Quran is written in was actually invented in Hira as a way of communicating, firstly, the Manichaean texts. Mani was a great spiritual prophet, teacher of the second century AD, and a lot of his ideas got into the Quran. Right? The idea that there's going to be a last judgment, that God is on the side of the believers, that there have been a whole series of prophets who come and then there's the seal of the prophets. Well, initially, the seal of the prophets was Mani. It was only later um, brought into the Quran as Muhammad. And it was never intended to mean the last of the prophets. It never says that. The seal is the one that guarantees the authenticity of the message. It's not the last message. Anyway, that's a little glimpse. What I've been doing in this commentary has never been attempted before. It's only because I've studied history, world history, for 20 years, studied and taught in Islamic societies and cultures, that I have been able to reconstruct the Quran's actual story. Um, my commentary also, for the first ever time, and I wish Professor Aslam was here, but I'm sure he'll listen to this. It's a commentary taking the Quran in its chronological sequence. So the Quran that you have, if you go to the shop and buy a Quran, it comes in an order where the, um, 
the biggest suras are at the front. You read through, they're very long, like 30, 40 pages. And you go through and then in the end, they're very short. That's not the order it was received in. That's an order set by a committee after Muhammad's death. And it was actually modeled on Jewish scriptures. They were written in that way. Long, long things first, then later, shorter ones. Well, what I've done is I've put it back into the chrono chronological order that it was actually received in. It makes no sense to me to read a book uh, just by the length of chapter. If we did that with the, the Bible, it would all be jumbled up. We wouldn't have the sequence, the narrative. If we did it with the Vedas, we wouldn't get you know, the beginning and the middle and the end. Imagine the, um, the Gita all jumbled up. No, you have to have it in chronological sequence. So I've done that with the Quran. And in doing that, that's when I've discovered all these things about um, the actual um, spiritual growth of Muhammad, because his biography has never been properly studied psychoanalytically. What I've done is I've applied the teachings of um, modern transpersonal psychology, people like Ken Wilber that was mentioned earlier, who've studied the different levels of consciousness. And I've gone back over the formation of the Quran and I've said, what would Muhammad have been thinking to be receiving these verses in this way? Okay, and that's, a, that's never been asked before, so far as I know, by any philosophers in history. Some Muslim commentators have asked, and they've explored the notion of prophetic consciousness. What does it mean to be a prophet and to receive messages from God? I mean, that's a major thing, right? I don't think anyone at this forum, we're not going to claim that. What does it mean? So in my study of the Quran, I'm arguing that it means that you can tune in to the highest transpersonal source of being. Uh, and many speakers have talked about the need to do that, to, to tune into the, the transcendental God level of being. But then, as um, uh, some speakers have said, I think it was um, Glenn pointed out, within the God levels of consciousness, there are different levels there also. The fact that you can tune into clairvoyancy or whatever doesn't mean you're fully enlightened. So we have to begin to differentiate, you know, between the prophetic skills of person X or Y, and what do they do with those prophetic skills? So, you know, I'm sharing this in full candor and, and truthfulness, because what I've discovered in my reading of the Quran is that Muhammad had his off days, just as every prophet, you know, Jesus brought the whip out in the temple. That was probably a bad move made him lots of enemies, and he was dead within a few weeks. Muhammad got the whip out. And what's very unusual about Muhammad's career is that he was not only a prophet and a rishi and a seer and a Buddha, he took the sword and became a warrior and a general. And that's a dangerous mixture. You know, um, as, a, as a forum dedicated to peace and enlightenment, we need to study why it is some prophets think that fighting, killing, and war making is the answer to global enlightenment. You know, so that's what I've been studying, confronting. Um, and the answer is that he was opposed, he was attacked. Initially, for the first few years of his life in Mecca, he was very peace-loving, he was non-violent, he said, pray to those that attack you. He was like a religious studies teacher. But his followers and he were spat at, they were stones were thrown at them, they were exiled into the desert where they were going to die. Uh, some of their followers were killed, tortured to death, staked out in the ground and, and died. You know, they were really, really had their human rights attacked. Why? Be all because Muhammad was telling people to remember that their souls and bodies and that were on a God project here. That's what we should be doing. And the people that opposed him were very wealthy, corrupt businessmen, merchants, who didn't want to be reminded about God. They wanted their profits. And in their temple in Mecca and the Kaaba, they had 365 deities. And people would come on pilgrimage from all over, uh, you know, Arabia and bring them lots of money. It was a racket, as we'd call it. So, um, <clears throat> So Muhammad was challenging the theological basis of their business. 
And I, I think we have to see that that's why he then eventually, he went to another town, Medina. He, was, he wouldn't fight back. He just said, OK, I'm leaving. But then the Meccans came after him there as well. And he was attacked. They tried to kill him. And eventually he fought back. He said, no, OK, fine. Enough is enough. We are allowed to self-defend. But in Islam, you only self-defend as a last resort. You always try to make peace first. And I think that's logical. I think most of us, if we were attacked by a mad axeman coming into the office and they were going to chop up our wife or husband or whatever, we, we defend ourselves, right? That's what Islam is saying. So I think if we freeze the dialogue there, if our, you know, next time, hopefully our professor can speak, I think it's reasonable to begin to have a dialogue between Islam and other religions. I want the World Intellectual Forum to, to, um, to advance that dialogue instead of just calling all Muslims terrorists and they're all violent and you know and instead of passing legislation that antagonizes them and all that I'd love to see for instance in Kashmir a real dialogue between the Muslim population and the Hindu population and the small Buddhist population about peace what we're discussing now we should be doing it in Kashmir next time you should be in Srinagar with a Muslim and a Hindu and we should say well look actually we all agree that the ultimate is the divine the God level of things let's elevate our dis disagreements to God and I can tell you that the Quran is a fantastic text if even if you're not a Muslim read the Quran study it listen to my commentary it's like a peace tool and this should have been done in Afghanistan when when well, it still should be. The Afghan people are still not at peace. I think we should be like peace missionaries among the Muslims of Afghanistan who are still fighting each other and, and help bring peace there. Okay, the final point I want to make, um, and then I've done my bit for um, Allah, <laughs> is the big, the big thing that's been used um, since 9 11 to beat the Muslims and justify the war in Iraq and everything is to say, well, yes, but they're all terrorists. Look at bin Laden. They attack New York and they're terrible. Let's go and get them. Now that was the Bush uh, <clears throat> response to the events of New York. I want to report to this learned gathering that I've just spent two years researching the events of 9-11 as a historian. My PhD from the University of London as a historian stopped in 2001. I researched what happened on the events of 9-11. And I have to say with, with all due respect that it simply cannot have been 19 Muslim so-called terrorists uh, led by bin Laden from a cave in Afghanistan. The real story of 9-11 has still not been told. But the architects and engineers um, um, and many other scholars have now researched this matter in such detail that I think I can tell you with 100% accuracy that the Twin Towers of New York and the other building were not brought about down by uh, four hijacked planes. Therefore, there's something else going on. And the, the narrative of Muslims, bin Laden, let's get them, is actually a false history. We've been living for the last 19 years, I mean, it's shocking, in a false history when we've accepted this image of the bad Muslims, the terrorists and all that. What if it's not true? What if somebody else was behind 9-11? I think then that turns our world upside down, actually. Well, I can report that it looks like that is true. Provisionally, <coughs> I've launched the International Historical Commission for 9-11 on the anniversary a couple of weeks ago. And I would request anyone who's in touch with any professional historians of caliber, we should get together and go into this matter. Because my concern is that unless we get truth on this planet, we won't get proper peace. And we certainly won't get it in the Middle East. And it seems to me the demonization of Islam just has to stop. We have to understand where they're coming from, why, go into the origin of the text of the Quran, as I've been doing. And, and then we can sympathize and have compassion and empathy and build bridges of understanding. And to me, okay, my final point is, I've often 
mused on this puzzle. What is Islam? What does it mean? For those that don't know, it means it means to surrender. Islam is, is from the same root as Salam, Shalom, and Jerusalem. It means, it means to surrender your ego to the absolute, to God, which is everyone's agreed in this discussion. That's what we have to do through meditation, prayer, you know, yoga. That's the game, right? We're now being forced with COVID to do it all in the home. <laughs> well, all we got to do is get rid of these egos. And that's what Muhammad said. 1400 years ago, he said, look guys, surrender it all to God. And so that's what the word Islam means. It's not something scary that terrorists do. It's giving up the ego. Now the West, and, and uh, Ian Fry spoke about the West, you know, has such a big ego, it has problems with this. Um, and, but I think it's gonna be possible. And in my final conclusion, I'd like to say in, philosophy and in Jainism we're taught something very important it's the concept of epoche this is a Greek word epoche means to surrender judgment we don't know something the philosopher will say I don't know this or I don't know that so I'm in epoche it may be that it may be that siadvada is the technical term in Jainism right epoche is the root of skeptical philosophy in, in Western thought. Cicero, um, Piro of Ellis, and the modern Western academic tradition is based on suspension of judgment, epoche. Husserl, the great um, founder of phenomenology, bases his entire philosophy. So did Hegel on this concept of suspension of judgment. And, you know, we love it, us Western thinkers. Well, what if, this is my hypothesis, what if what we mean by epoche is exactly the same as what Muslims mean by Islam? By Islam, they're surrendering judgment to a higher power. In epoche, we're surrendering judgment to the, to the gods, the higher power. So I hope, um, you know, if we have a conversation at that level, which is what I'm trying to do with the, um, you know, let's say European Islamic Middle Eastern dialogue and involving Palestine and Israel, we're not going to get Israel-Palestine solved until we have that level of dialogue. We're stuck in this level, as, as Sachin put it, like kids in a playground fighting over candy, um, <clears throat> and the ego of each nation is involved. We have to surrender. Actually, we all have to become proper suspenders of judgment proper uh, surrenders to God. And then I think we can, you know, uh, act as um, vehicles to receive that grace. Now, just final little thing, you may not know this in the Quran, several passages in the Quran, Muhammad says, or the angel that he's channeling, says, there is a, um, there's a divine grace of, of peace um, that comes upon everybody at a certain moment. The shakin is the Arabic term. And this shakin is exactly as the Kabbalists talk about the Shekinah, which is the goddess, the feminine aspect of God. And it's there in the Quran. So again, um, there are so many things in the Quran you can study from a Kabbalistic point of view, a Gnostic uh, point of view, and there's absolutely no reason why we can't do scholarship together instead of violence and war. Right, so anyway, that's my little talk. Um, and I hope that you've enjoyed that. That's what uh, Professor Aslam was supposed to give, <laughs> but I've given it in his stead. So uh, apologies. Um, okay, now we come to the final. Any questions to any speaker? Just who wants to go first? <clears throat> Um, uh, someone who hasn't spoken for a while. What about um, Katia Yani? You've not said anything for a while. Is that any help uh, in your non-killing work, do you think? Uh, yes, it would help a lot. I have one question uh, with regard to the Islamic talk which you just delivered. Okay. Uh, you spoke about that there should be surrender from part of individuals. But uh, uh, I, uh, 
surrender should come voluntary or should it be forced because at times what happens is people do not surrender themselves voluntarily so the other people come and force them to surrender and i believe there in the problem comes where there is a conflict or tussle so uh, how do you how are we supposed to make uh, solve resolve this because if we are to force ourselves on other people that you know you should respect this policy or this principle uh, then it uh, automatically negates the very own its very own basis because you are asking to someone to surrender and if the person is not agreeing to surrender then you are uh, harming them violently so uh, i think that's what happens with uh, the muslim terrorists uh, they try to force surrender so okay now that's an excellent question and and a very tricky one thank you um you're absolutely right of course it's 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 totally wrong for me to say look i'm teaching spiritual surrender to god and if you don't do it my way i'm going to shoot you i mean that invalidates as you say the whole thing what i've been trying to do in my study of muhammad's life story is to see how he made that shift at a certain point in his life he stopped being a lovely peaceful let's all surrender to god kind of guy and became a well this is what we're doing we're surrendering to god our way and if you don't want to join us um that's fine but then after a while it was okay but now i'm going to come after you and make you do this and he became a warrior who who was responsible during his lifetime there are about 60 battles between his his group and other groups armies um you know so he became a warrior and a very effective one So what I'm trying to do in my study is to work out how he p- went from being a peaceful loving prophet to becoming a warrior who forces you to do it his way. And I think it's quite an important research task. Um I'm happy, you know. And I think what happened was when Islam began to spread, it spread as the warrior creed and it kind of lost its inner spiritual surrender path. The people that taught that are called Sufis. They were the knowers, but um they were not able to um you know hold their own and often they were killed as heretics and stuff. So there's a big big um yeah, huge lot of questions there. But anyway, listen to my commentary on the Quran. It's it's trying to explain it all. Um thank you for the question. Any other any other questions to any of the other speakers? Um, uh one more question i wanted to ask was with regard to the biological warfare that point which was put by marco that okay, uh, ask marco he's still with us uh, uh yes uh, so what i basically want to know how much information has been uh, uh received from that and as to whether uh, that because the, the covid thing has become problematic for nearly the whole world but uh, when you see china from where this problem actually started to occur chinese people i believe are now free from that particular pandemic so uh, was it really a biological warfare system or uh, created by the chinese or was it naturally evolved well as it look like as it look like uh, as it looks like now uh wuhan lab cooperated with uh, at least uh, us uh, us uh, biological warfare uh, experts what uh, what my colleagues uh, claim doctors uh, uh, regarding regarding the analysis of the genetic structure of the uh covid uh virus it involves components which could not mutate naturally uh over such short time like components of previous sars uh, uh even ebola etc so uh, some of the experts who did look at 
uh, at the state of the art of analysis of current virus claimed that it is uh, hypothetically almost uh, ruled out the hypothesis that uh, it would evolve naturally concerning the, the research done now uh, on genetic structure. So there is really a great probability that Wuhan lab, which is uh, the most uh, competent lab for production of biological warfare, uh, actually in cooperation with some other counter -intell intelligences uh, produced uh, produced the, the the whole thing the fact that you mentioned that china is was very quickly out of the danger uh, proves the hypothesis the whole thing is under control it is um, under observance if you want um, if virus would spread that quickly, then then uh, um, the control would not be so effective. So your your uh, point that you underline is absolutely in place. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Any other comments on that point? Um, on the on the question of COVID, perhaps has anyone else got any points? Um, well, uh, on this point, uh, Marco. You know, if it here's here's the risk. The fact that this news coming out that there is a relationship with the Wuhan um, lab and, and the Chinese government, where do we as peacekeepers focus on in revealing the truth, which can then escalate into world war, which can escalate into horrible things? That uh, you know, Thomas, I wanted your reflection and Marco. Do we? If, if, do we keep fanning the flames or we just deal with the aftermath as, as a global society? Or do we really work to, to, to hunt to the root causation of this and, and why and where, which can then escalate into like the most serious problems. On it. So I'm in that moral conflict of, of, of that. Marco, you go first. <laughs> Well, the first question is a research about probability that the virus was produced produced in labs intentionally, in labs plural. Mm -hmm. the, the fact is that the first appearance and massive uh, suffusion of the virus was uh, the province of Wuhan. Huh? That's just, a, that's just a fact. Uh, so whether or not it was developed in the lab of Wuhan or somewhere else and brought to, to that uh, spectacular market, animal market, is another question. Huh? But we are in the midst of research. We, we are researching the facts and hypothesis. So it's not, it's not gambling concerning fueling up, the, fueling up uh, any hatred. What, what is at stake is most probably a large cooperation of, uh, of uh, intelligent services. What, what was the purpose behind that is, is another thing. I mentioned only a couple of hypotheses, uh, what, could be the, what could be the main targets. And you will read it in my issues paper that I will share with you later on after, after the Zoom. But we are in the midst of research. What we agree uh, is that uh, we shall seek for truth. That, that's our main cause, huh? Uh, could no. I make a comment here? Yeah, go for it. Um, uh, I, I think truth is very important, and and it's not a good idea to cover up anything that is uh, untruthful. Or, but uh, I think our our main effort should be to eliminate these kinds of labs from the world. You know, and they're, they're all over the place. They're in Canada, they're in the United States, they're in China, and all of them uh, on the uh, false pretense of protecting ourselves against biological warfare, all of them are creating biological war elements. And uh, so we need to think, how can we get a world system in which these, these labs are just not allowed to exist, they're just abolished? We could do it. Uh, Thomas, I'd like to buy in on this. I agree with what Ben's saying. I agree uh, with what Marco has said. But my conclusion at this stage is 
for all the evidence that I have available that uh, the most probable source uh, origin of a militarized version was the American Fort uh, Detrick uh, Laboratory, not Ruhan. They, there was such a close exchange of staff and material and work between those two laboratories, Fort Detrick and Ruhan. Right. And the were financed. Right. Staff. And um, so I think that's where it will end up that uh, it was a passage from one to the other. I don't know, Marco, you're nodding, I don't know <laughs> whether you want to respond to that. <laughs> Um, okay, let me just come in there then to say, I'd love to hear what the view is in Moscow about this, if Alexander's still with us. Uh, what do people in Russia say about this virus? Is it accidental? What's the official news channel? And then what do people say on the street, so to say? Are you still with us, Alex? Uh, Thomas, uh, yeah. I think uh, we are talking uh, more than four hours today is, is so many questions, so many no. problems, and <laughs> so on and so on. Islam, uh, it's coronavirus and uh, culture, and so on and so on. I know. Well, we're about to finish soon. Don't yes, worry. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's a very good conversation. I appreciate very much uh, to listen different uh, position from different part of our world, but. Uh, uh, I think we must um, um, care about the uh, main topic of our conversation, global thinking for peace and sustainability. And that is why I'd like to say that if we will talking so much uh, about religion, especially Islam, maybe, and maybe we will mm, 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 talking a lot of about coronavirus, especially it is uh, topics for another conversation, maybe. Because uh, here is, we, we will not find a way to solution a question we, which you wanted to solve. And how we can find a way to our living in our earth uh, without a war, uh, in a peace. And uh, how can we understand each other better than now? Because a terrible situation uh, in the earth now. And in, in my opinion, if we will look in only uh, for such question as a religion, for example, so it's a, not Islamic, way, it's a different religion, but religion is a piece of culture. But culture is, is, is a, um, has a three main roots, language, uh, traditions, and to religions. It's not all, uh, but it's the main roots. But if we will look in, uh, we will look in uh, for this direction to find a um, way to understanding each other, we will not find a way because each of us belong to especially culture. Each of us has especially language, beliefs, uh, traditions, and so on. So on. It's, Culture separate us. Yes, I'm Russian. You're English. You're American. You're Indian. It's separate. It's not good and not uh, not bad. It's reality. We must understand it. But the main question: which way then we must uh, choose to uh, go together for understanding for mutual. Um, communication and so on and so on and so on. In my opinion, it is civilizing, civilizing uh, our mind, the mind of societies, what, what I mean at first of all, we must look in for common, common law, common uh, ethics, common values. And this is the main questions, uh, this is the main topic what kind of me, uh, we talking in uh, such uh, conversation when we are looking um, common of, for us um, uh, suitable uh, position in our world. 
Uh, I, uh, I apologize for so long talking because it's uh, too late. It's, it's uh, uh, no more than three for it's uh, finished because after that we will go uh, <laughs> around the circle, you know, <laughs> and we'll return and return. But uh, excuse me uh, for more. Uh, no, thank you. Uh, thank you, Alexander. My words, but I'd like to finish. Uh, to say that it is very good conversation. Maybe, Thomas, we must uh, have such uh, conferences from time to time. Uh, but maybe not so long. Maybe two, no more than three hours. Um, about two hours, uh, regularly maybe. It will be very good. And World uh, inter uh, uh, Intellectual Forum uh, can, uh, and you especially, uh, thank you very much uh, again. Uh, for this conference. We will prepare such conference. Thank you. Well, thank you, Alex. And I just want to tell people that may not know, Alex was at the World Congress of Philosophy. The last one met in Beijing. And he met many Chinese philosophers, high intellectuals. If you've kept friendships from there, Alex, please ask them to join our work. Yeah, yes, must, of course. You know, there are some very, very clever Chinese philosophers. Very good. They ought to be joining us next time. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm. I'm proposing we should try and do this once a month, as long as at least the lockdown goes on. So I'll send uh, I'll send people another invitation, if if as I say if we can get a, a Chinese scholar, you know, uh, on the global philosophical level, that would be excellent. Right, I think that um, <clears throat> uh, we have. Um, uh, has anyone got any final words of wisdom you have to share before we close? Because Alex wants his tea. <laughs> uh, we can't solve all the problems of the world in this first meeting. Um, Thomas, may I ask a question? Uh, I made a, a notice in chat, but uh, perhaps you didn't uh, notice it. Uh, I would like to ask if it is possible uh, to make uh, to uh, a statement uh, on behalf of uh, our forum uh, about the aggression against uh, Nagorno-Karabakh and Armenia. If you consider it, it possible, I can prepare a draft and uh, tomorrow send uh, uh, to you. Well, I can, I can say on behalf of the European wing of World Intellectual Forum, yes, please do that. Bear in mind that the, the, uh, the Turkish and others, the Azeris, are saying it's you that's the aggressor. So what we want to know is proof either way. <laughs> and this goes back to the question somebody asked is, should we know the truth if it causes trouble? I take the view as a philosopher, we shouldn't know the truth. So tell us your truth. Why do you think it's an aggression by them? Uh, the truth is one. Uh, there cannot be two or more truth, uh, uh, in my view. Uh, I will uh, send also some uh, materials, uh, information. Okay, uh, and I'll circulate it to the group. And, you know, we can add our names to it if we agree with the wording. What I would absolutely pledge is that we would be willing to help mediate without knowing the full story. We, and I think this is Russia's position. I heard uh, Putin say this, that, you know, because for them, both Armenia and Nagorno-Karabakh used to be parts of the Soviet Union. They don't want to see war going on. They want you to live in peace. So I think Russia's offered to mediate. Uh, I don't see why you don't immediately fly off to Moscow and take him and his word. Lavrov would mediate, I'm sure. Um, but anyway, yes, please do circulate. Um, okay, send. thank you. Thank you, I will send. Important, yeah. Right, okay, well, look, I think it's time. Um, uh, you know, there's many more things we could say and everybody could have gone on, but thank you so much for coming, being part of this event. Um, I hope it's helped, um, you know, we've, we've asked some difficult questions and uh, we've had a note from um, Professor Siddhartha who had to leave early, giving a vote of thanks to everyone who spoke on behalf of Trans Brahma. He's very grateful that you could all speak 
Um, and likewise, on behalf of, um, you know, the uh, World Intellectual Forum, uh, I'm sure that our chairman, uh, who's also had to leave early, Swami Nathan, would, would say thank you to everyone. And, and please, let's keep in touch. Let's do this once a month. Um, let's get people from different traditions involved, from China, for instance, um, and from other cultures, um, from the Middle East. From We have several members from Israel who should have been on this conversation and um, hopefully will join us next time. It's important that we, and we also have members from Palestine, top intellectuals on both sides. So, you know, we can use this forum as a neutral body. The global intellect <laughs> is what we all have in common. I know that um, we're also souls, but we also share a global intellectual. In Arabic, it's called the Akal, the divine intellect. And, um, you know, let's, let's recognize that unity um, within us all. Okay, so thank you, brothers and sisters. And, um, Let's be in touch. Um, Thank you, Thomas. Okay. Uh, can I just ask, um, Satyan, are you still with us? Yes, right here, Thomas. Can you just lead us in a closing meditation, just like two minutes visualization? Absolutely. Do it so if well. We can, if we can all just sit and open our bodies, our hearts, our beings, and just feel who we are, what we are right now. And we can feel our place on the planet right now. If we can visualize and see, we are all in different parts of the planet. And if we can just imagine and intend that wherever we are on the planet, that each one of us is a guardian, a pillar, a transmission of peace, hope, clarity, unity, consciousness, common sense, the well wellness for all. Wherever we are sitting in the world, let's imagine our hearts are connecting and that we are a, a grid, a magical grid around the world. And then although we show up as individuals, we are really one tapestry, one interconnected transmission to raise the whole world into its next state of consciousness. And then bring that world now inside of our hearts. Rather than sit on the world, imagine the whole world is coming deep within our hearts. And let's breathe light, love, and our deepest intention for the sake of all beings. May all beings know peace. May all beings know truth. May all beings know wellness, wholeness, happy hearts, happy bellies, happy families, happy society. To the great one that animates and lives us all. Oh. Oh. Thank you, Sachin. And thank you to everyone again, and uh, blessed be to everyone, and we'll meet again next time.